Great, thank you all so much for joining us today. This session is called Finding Healthcare at Your Laundromat, Grocery, and Barbershop. So we're hoping that this will be a bit of like barbershop talk, if you will. Um, I'm introducing my, pa uh, my panelists here. We have Courtney Bragg, who is the co-founder of Fabric Health. We have AJ Johnson, who is the founder and CEO of Oasis Fresh Market. And we have uh, Joseph, Joseph Ravenel, who is Associate Professor of Population Health and Medicine and Associate Dean for Diversity and Inclusion at NYU Grossman School of Medicine. Okay, so to start us off, I'd love if our panelists could tell us a bit about themselves, their organizations, and how you serve your community. Courtney, I'll start with you. Uh, nice to meet you all. I'm Courtney, and I'm obsessed with laundromats. <laughs> um, I hope you will be by the end of this, too. Um, I started my career in education, and first and foremost, my insight is built off of the students and families I was lucky to serve. And so how stressful today is for many of us, it, it's existential for, for many of the families that I so deeply care about. Uh, but the insight around laundromats for me is not the shiny machines, it's the two hours that our busiest families are spending in them on a weekly basis. And so for us at Fabric Health, our insight was, instead of asking our families to put one more thing on their plate and always do one more appointment nine months later, or anything else, what if we actually showed up and were helpful in the time and space that they have? And, and that turns out to be over 100 hours a year with families, and we found that to be incredibly, incredibly powerful. Snaps, that's my, can you? <laughs> <laughs> so Which is sorry. a quick reminder, just, everyone, silence your real phones. Life. That's this AJ's mom calling. Real <laughs> life. <laughs> no, see, <laughs> just rolling. It's all, it's all so, good. So AJ. Your turn, tell us a bit about yourself. Was that an important call from the grocery shop? Uh, grocery it store? probably was. <laughs> um, but my name is Aaron Johnson, AJ, and what you just saw happens every day, real life, right in front of you. Uh, I'm the first generation business owner in my family. Uh, my wife is Asian, and we have three beautiful Blasian daughters, black <laughs> and Asian. Uh, we're in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Oasis, the definition of Oasis means refuge, safe place, shelter. So it's the first grocery store in what was once called Black Wall Street in over 14 years. And so for us to be in the heart of North Tulsa really means a lot because I didn't grow up having someone that looked like me own a business. And to be in an underserved community like North Tulsa where the life expectancy rate is 11 years shorter than any other community. Um, for us to be that refuge, we have a nonprofit as well. So we try to combine health and education and just our goal is re really to be the center of the community mm -hmm. in every way we can be. Thank you. And Joseph, go right ahead. Hi, everyone. I'm Joseph Ravenel. Uh, I am a primary care doctor. I also do research on health equity, which is really figuring out how we can ensure that all segments of our population experience good health. Uh, and one of the ways that we have sought to do that is really by trying to connect to the uh, communities that are most in need and really involve them in, in the process of improving their health. And we have found that for communities like black men, that uh, barbershops and other, uh, and other trusted places with trusted people uh, are where uh, we can uh, introduce them to the, uh, to, to the uh, healthcare system. So. Great, thank you. And I'd love to let everyone in the audience know that we hope this is a bit you know, interactive. So if you have questions, feel free to raise your hands and ask them. We wanna make sure everyone's voice is heard. So Joseph, you had just talked about trust and the importance of, there's this term that you know, some people are familiar with, but in your industries, you know it very well. Trusted messengers. Can you tell us a bit about what role a trusted messenger plays at a barbershop? And then I'll be sure to direct the same question to everyone else, but I'd love to start with you. So trusted messengers are those people in the community where regardless of the letters behind their, their name, and often there are no letters, uh, those are the people who have the, the uh, credibility, the people that, uh, that the community actually listens to. Uh, and so when we're talking about black men, uh, barbers are actually one of those uh, key trusted leaders. And I've been told by, by some of my patients that black men in particular uh, often trust their barbers more than they trust their uh, doctors mm. uh, for a whole host of reasons that we will uh, get into, but barbers certainly fall into the category of trusted messengers. 
And now, AJ, for yourself, I mean, at the grocery store, I guess that would mean you and your, your colleagues who are working there are the trusted messengers. Tell me a bit about what that responsibility is like and how you work as a trusted messenger there. Well, for us, we have a saying, we want people to be seen, to feel safe, and to be heard. And one of the many ways we do that is we have a first Saturday every month where we bring in organizations, trusted organizations, mm -hmm. dietitians, mm -hmm. doctors, nurses, lawyers, uh, that will help the community. So trust for us looks like really individuals that come, everybody's gotta eat. Right. So they often come to the grocery store, but just like the barber shop, they find that safe haven in a place that they frequently visit and faces that, that we often see um, every single day. Right, and now Courtney, I feel like for you, the challenge is a little different because I know at least when I've used laundry mats, I don't want anyone talking to me, honestly. I just want to you know, go in there, do my stuff, maybe listen to some music while the machines are going, and then come on out. What are the challenges you face trying to be a trusted messenger in that environment? How does that work? Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's something you have to acknowledge and understand is, mm -hmm. I think, the first thing. Um, and and when, when I think about the, the challenges that we face and how we approach our community, particularly somewhere like North Philly, mm -hmm. there is a lot of scams. There's a lot of predatory practices. And so within that, we have to acknowledge that there has been so much trust broken. Mm -hmm. But when I walk up to someone in a North Philly laundromat and I say, there are 100,000 people uninsured in Philly, mm -hmm. you know someone. We, we partner with the state of Pennsylvania. Have them text us. Have them call us. Like We'll meet them in the laundromat. Mm -hmm. We're here. And, and what we found is incredible resonance. And, and I think about a woman named Karina in North Philly. Mm -hmm. And she, she raised her hand. She said, can I come talk to you? I yeah. said, of course. And I sit down with her, we open my laptop and everything, and she says, you know, someone helped me get insured, and at the end she asked me for my bank account information. Mm -hmm. And there's no easy way to say, Miss Karina, you were the victim of a scam. Like, yeah. I'm glad you, you hung up, yeah. but let me show you how it works. No one mm. should ever be asking you that information. And so it takes that trust of, of treating someone with respect. Mm -hmm. It is simple, but not easy. Um, and showing up, and investing in that relationship. And what we found is you solve one problem with Karina. Mm -hmm. She gives you another and another. And then she's texting me, I've got a question about my diabetes medicine. Right. Or I, I'm not getting an answer on this. Mm -hmm. And we hear all of the time from the families we're lucky enough to serve in the laundromat, I only hear from people when there's a bill or when mm -hmm. they want something. Mm -hmm. And so for us, it's about solving real problems for real families that they surface, not what we want right. them to do first. And then they give you the opportunity to solve another and another, mm -hmm. and those are simultaneously the same massive business problems mm -hmm. that our healthcare system is facing. So walk me through kind of this, I guess, cold approach. How, how do you go from being someone who's in the laundromat and approaching someone who's doing their laundry and telling them, hey, I'd love to talk to you about healthcare? <laughs> I mean, yeah. you, do you do it on the first approach or the second? What is that like? I spend a lot of time picking up socks. <laughs> So it's really like, it's that, that simple but not easy thing. You don't walk up to someone and say, so this is an example I'll use. We've done mammograms in the laundromat. Mm -hmm. I am not walking up to someone in West Philadelphia, assuming they are 40 to 65 and are interested in talking to me about mammography. <laughs> like that is just not the way you start a conversation. Mm -hmm. So I spend a lot of time and my team does too at Fabric bringing laundry into the laundromat. Mm -hmm. I am really good at locking the washing machine because mm -hmm. it just doesn't start if you don't hear that click. We spend a lot of time building relationships with the laundromat attendants mm -hmm. who will vouch for us and say they're, they're good people, they're the real deal, and, and it comes from showing up and building trust. And we found, again, a remarkable resonance and, and the ability to scale mm -hmm. once you make that investment in the right. relationship. Thank you, thank you. And now, AJ, your uh, grocery store is called Oasis, and you're definitely not hiding the fact that you are there to combat uh, food deserts. Tell me a bit about you know, the food desert problem that we have and how that has you know, inspired you to do what you do and, and, and why it's important. Man, that's a great question. I remember, uh, I grew up in a single parent home, and I remember one specific encounter that I had as a young boy we were in a different part of town, and uh, my mom asked me to run inside and, and get some groceries, uh, just a few items. And long story short, we were on a side of town that really the, the customer base wasn't using food stamps. Mm -hmm. 
And I remember getting to the cash register and the cashier didn't know how to process back then what was paper mm -hmm. food stamps. And so I remember being a young black boy feeling what I felt like was all eyeballs on me in that moment because over the intercom, I need help at register whatever processing food stamps. Mm -hmm. And then another manager came or shift lead, whatever they were at that time, they didn't know either how to do it. So they had to call the store manager. Mm -hmm. So what, what I felt was at the time, I didn't know it was trauma, but I felt in, in the height of rush hour, mm -hmm. all of these eyes on me as a, as a young boy. Mm -hmm. And that's when I recognized we're different. Mm -hmm. And not knowing that would come full circle, that my first, I call it government job at 13, would be a bag boy at a local grocery store. And my first job coming out of college was a district manager uh, over a grocery store as well. And so all of those things, I never woke up and said, I'm going to wake up and fight food deserts. Right. But I think life comes mm -hmm. in full circle. So to now be in this position, growing up in a single parent home, mm -hmm. knowing the challenges that uh, single parent students and children go through, the sleepless nights, mm -hmm. sometimes the red disconnect notices that are on the door, my heart breaks mm -hmm. for those students, for those families. And I can, I can relate to that because there were moments that I, that was me. Right. And um, so to now to be in this, this fight, really, it's about giving everyone access. We mm -hmm. believe that everyone deserves the divine right to have access to fresh and healthy food. Mm -hmm. And it shouldn't matter where you're born, shouldn't matter what you look like, um, or what your family lineage is. Right. It's, a, it's a basic right. And um, it affects test scores in, in school for children, mm -hmm. empty stomachs. It affects how a child will behave. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we, we think that breaking that prison to that prison pipeline by giving students fresh and healthy access is key mm -hmm. and educating families on healthy eating. Mm -hmm. We've got a, a program called Ballin' on a Budget where we teach families that. healthy eating right. um, really on, on, their, on their food stamp dollars. Mm -hmm. No, that's, that's, that's fantastic. And I mean, in terms of just what the community had before Oasis came in, what is it that people would be, you know, if they wanted fresh fruit or if they wanted any of that, where would they go? What would they have to do? Well, in North Tulsa, particularly, mm -hmm. um, my area, there are $10 generals, but there was not yet one complete grocery store. Wow. So imagine for 14 years needing to make a dinner for your family with Raymond noodles, with mac and cheese, mm -hmm. with bologna and hot dogs. How do we expect families to live healthier lives, mm -hmm. giving them those type of meals? Right. Um, so it's, it's no wonder that we have all these additional mm -hmm. chronic diseases in underserved communities. And so that's why we have to find solutions. And, and we believe the for-profit, non-profit model that we have mm -hmm. uh, is, is an excellent component to really combat the food deserts across the country. Oh, that's great. Um, Joseph, so you were talking about trust and how often people, um, you know, especially black men at barbershops, will trust their barber more so than their, their doctor or their primary care mm -hmm. physician. How do you get the barber to trust you? Great question. Uh, and it goes back to something that, uh, that, that Courtney and AJ uh, both said, which is showing up and mm -hmm. being there persistently. Uh, sort of you know, swooping in and saying, hey, I'd love for you to participate in this project and never coming back again just doesn't work. The way to build trust and rapport is to actually keep showing up and developing a relationship with the barbers and the uh, barber shops. And we realized very early on that without that relationship and without that trust, it was basically a non-starter. But what we also realized was that relationship and that trust really is the sort of bedrock um, of what happens in a, a barber shop, right? And so if you think about the difference between uh, how a man accesses a barbershop compared to how, how they access a, a, a doctor's office, right? So uh, you all only go to the doctor when you really, really need to. Um, and often you go, you really don't, you don't wanna go. Uh, but when you go to the barbershop, it's because you have time. Mm -hmm. uh, and generally, you know that you're going to have a good experience. And at the end of it, you're gonna come out looking pretty good as well. Um, <laughs> and, you, and you do that basically twice a month as compared to once a year maybe when you go to see the uh, doctor. And so one thing we, we, we realized that in addition to being 
a safe haven for uh, black men. It's a place where multiple conversations happen, mm -hmm. and some of those conversations focus on uh, health. And you know, just as, as AJ and, and uh, Courtney said, the fact that, uh, that the men come back, mm -hmm. whether they need health care or not, is what really makes it uh, special. And so we really do sort of leverage that frequency of uh, return. Mm -hmm. And what that means is we, as the sort of healthcare partner, have to uh, conduct ourselves in a way that the barbers actually want us there and that the customers actually want us there. Mm -hmm. So building that partnership is absolutely critical. No, that, that's fantastic. And as you were saying, you know, people see their barbers pretty frequently. I know I get my fade every like two to three weeks. So I hear, you know, got to get that line. I've got to look good. So I hear you. Exactly. Got to keep your fresh, fresh, fresh food. Hey. Um, so, so for you, Joseph, my question is, how do you help barbers help their patient, uh, help their clients yes. overcome stigmas, especially when it comes to healthcare. So we've talked a little bit about yes. this and something that is quite the threat in the black community, especially amongst black men, is colorectal cancer. Yes. So I'm a reporter at STAT. A story that I had done um, was when I actually went and got my own colonoscopy and we, we filmed it. <laughs> and <laughs> the idea behind that had to do with, I had a family history of colorectal cancer and also my hero, you know, Chadwick Bozeman, he died of this. And that really compelled me into action that, you know what, I need to get checked myself. I need to, you know, I need to go forth and I need to do this action. And we filmed it so I could show other young black men like myself that this isn't something you should be afraid of. It's a very intimate part of your body. And mm -hmm. I could only imagine what that conversation is like with my barber. He's yes, just like, yes. hey, man, like, have you checked your, your colon lately? Like, <laughs> so how, how, do you, how do you work with barbers and equip them with the tools to fight those stigmas that are killing us? So you are absolutely right that talking about colorectal cancer from the jump as soon as someone sits in your chair is probably not a good idea. <laughs> um, and so what you want to do is really start, you really want to leverage the relationship that, um, that you have had with your barber, particularly for talking about these very challenging topics. And I really appreciate you highlighting the importance of colorectal cancer for black men. Uh, and Chadwick Boseman uh, is an unfortunate um, example of the fact that black men have the highest mortality mm -hmm. from uh, colorectal cancer. And I just want to uh, say hello to one of my colleagues in the audience, Dr. Daryl Gray, who is a gastroenterologist uh, and who actually really focuses on this uh, problem. Uh, but many black men don't know that they are at higher risk for uh, developing and dying from colorectal cancer and that there is a life-saving screening test that they can, can uh, undergo. And so we actually work with our barbers to give them that uh, in, information. And if they feel comfortable talking about it with the customers, that's great. But often, they don't feel comfortable. And what they do is they refer their customers to someone that they do trust, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. often me or uh, someone else. Right. And that first conversation can be a little bit rocky because we're trying to accomplish a, a couple different things. You know, one is we're trying to make men aware of that increased risk. And then we're talking about the life-saving screening, which, you know, and if we're talking about a colonoscopy, right, which is basically when a camera, uh, you know, goes into the rectum and actually looks for polyps, mm -hmm. uh, precancerous lesions that can turn into cancer if not addressed, uh, you know, talking uh, to men about that can be very challenging. And so we understand that, uh, that the uh, conversion, let's say, uh, from never even thinking about it to calling up to make an appointment for your colonoscopy may not happen within a 15 minute haircut. Uh, and so uh, the fact that it is a place where we're likely to see those men again and the fact that we come back means that we have multiple opportunities mm -hmm. to sort of move them along the stages of change. Um, and so to, to directly answer your, your, your question, Nicholas, uh, the conversation is rocky at first, but certainly the third conversation about it is much easier mm -hmm. than the first time we try to talk about it. I want to pause quickly before I get to my next question and just ask, does anyone in the audience have a question for our panelists right now? Yes, go right ahead, Ricardo. Just a question on, um, on business models. Uh, mm. right, so you've got uh, we, have a, we have a microphone for you. That way you can elevate it to everybody. <laughs> Appreciate it. Uh, just a question on business model. Um, so uh, you know, you've got the for-profit, non-profit side of the grocery store. Right, which I imagine the nonprofit side is um, subsidizing, while traditional, why you know traditional grocery stores aren't going into the community. So there's not not a, a margin on this on the grocery store, which subsidizes some of the 
pieces on the on the nonprofit side, just trying to figure out from both Fabric and um, uh, uh, Oasis. Oasis. I'm sorry. Um, just what, sort of what the business model looks like, because it's for, if it's I work for a payer, um, mm -hmm. and so if it's you work for who? I work for uh, a payer. I lead strategy for Care First, Blue Cross Blue Shield, okay. and if, if we're thinking about having a payer pay for it, right? Trying to figure out what the ROI is, or mm -hmm. is there a sustainable business model that's there, you know, organically? Mm -hmm. Courtney, if you want to go first. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, there has to be a sustainable business model. If not, it's it's good intentions and it's a one-off, and then we're parachuting in and out. Again, um, so for us, it's everyone is always trying to enroll new members. So we partner pri predominantly with payers. Uh, we launched with the state of Pennsylvania and the Penny Marketplace, again, because there are 100,000 uninsured folks in Philly. Um, but everyone is always worried about membership growth. That's just the reality of it. The second part that we found in talking to our payer partners is they don't have contact information, much less a connection, with the vast majority of their members. Mm -hmm. And my laundromats are 40% Medicaid, 20% Medicare. Yeah. And my West Philly laundromat sees over 3,000 families a month. That is a lot of people and a lot of need. And when I think about the opportunity that's lost when a payer can't even contact that member and is relying on things like a call center or a mailer, that, that's massive in and of itself, but I think it, it gets overlooked. And then payers are investing in all of these incredible point solutions, like at-home colon cancer screening mm -hmm. <laughs> tests and other things. And, and the uptake and engagement in any of those point solutions mm -hmm. is single digits. And so how can you help improve someone's health if you can't even find them? Mm. And so for us, it's about finding people building a connection, solving a real problem for them, and starting with the real problem that that family has, and making that warm introduction to the payer. And then you've got, again, 100 plus hours in a year, and I always try and tell my payers, like, sometimes they get so excited to come on site, and I love the ones who are so excited to come on site, but I'm like, please don't try to do one year worth of healthcare work yeah. in one hour. That's mm -hmm. how no one wants to go to the barber shop anymore, <laughs> no one comes to my laundromat, right. because it's not understanding that investment that you have to make. Mm -hmm. Um, and so that's, that's how we approach mm -hmm. it. And we do understand that it has to be the real problem for the family, but it has to be solving a business mm -hmm. problem for the plan. And now, AJ, tell us a bit about the business side and your nonprofit and how those kind of work together to achieve your mission. Yeah, um, great question. I was a student that uh, C's got degrees in college. So <laughs> I, I, I didn't have this, uh, you know, magnum cum laude, too, cum laude, thank the Lord. That was kind of <laughs> my, my approach to graduating college. So. I didn't have this awesome business plan, this plan of development. I said, man, if we're going to have a for-profit grocery store, there are wraparound services that must be there in a community where one in six people have access to transportation, in a community where there is no medical clinic except that of the emergency room. Mm -hmm. So how can we become that center of the community? So the nonprofit provides wraparound services. For example, we have... Uh, utility assistance programs uh, where an individual can come to the grocery store. We all need milk or eggs or, mm -hmm. or whatever, but even if they're not a customer of Oasis, they can come receive utility assistance, gas, electric, water. They can come get workforce development training. They can mm -hmm. learn how to build a resume. All of those things already exist in Tulsa, but we've just brought them into one place. So that way, when you are a grandma raising grandkids or you're a single parent mom or a single parent dad and you don't have transportation, but you have to go to the grocery store, mm -hmm. your, your grocery store experience is going to be 10 times more impactful because you're going to have the additional services. So was there a business model? No. There was a desire to how can we figure out how to maximize a community's, meeting a community's need mm -hmm. and Hopefully, you're going to be a partner in helping us sustain that. But I think our... <laughs> oh, always, hey. always closing. <laughs> always closing. <laughs> so you're going to be a part of this business yes. model, my man. <laughs> Courtney, were you about to say something? I think our shared insight, right, is there are all of these resources in the healthcare system, and they are not accessible to the people who mm -hmm. need them. And we have to stop building in a way that asks our busiest families to add one more thing to their plate. Right. I have a question for Joseph, but before I get to that, any more questions? Yes, right there. Go right ahead. Woo! Hello. 
Um, so I'm a colon cancer survivor. Hey. <laughs> She's amazing. And um, the way that I found out I had colon cancer was doing the poop test, mm -hmm. right? So now, all my friends, they hit 45, I'm like, get your poop test. <laughs> so part of what I'm wondering, right, you all are connecting people to providers, to services, to programs. How are you leveraging the folks who have a good experience with one of your services, your providers, mm -hmm. and having them as advocates so that it's not, and building expertise in the community and building some of that so that folks who are, who are, working with you, who are coming to, to get services from you are actually become advocates for the work that you're doing. Mm -hmm. Did you want to take that first, Justin? Absolutely. Joseph? So uh, con congratulations, number one. And, uh, and number two, uh, you hit it right on the head. That's one of the reasons that we're in barbershops, because uh, the, the men who are in barbershops, really, it really is a, a community. You know, I think about my own um, ex experience. When I had the time to go to a barbershop regularly, I would go basically, you know, every two weeks, Saturday morning, my appointment was at 7 a.m. There would be the same group. Well, so, uh, and so when you have young children, you have to take, your business, take care of your business like early, right? So, uh, but, uh, but it was the same group of, of uh, men. And, uh, and, and so if, if, if we could positively influence one of those men, there will be a ripple effect for the other men who are, uh, who are in that cohort. And so, and then that's also where uh, barbers come in, where if barbers have a positive um, experience or their customers have had a positive um, experience, they will pass the word along to their other customers. And so this idea of sort of leveraging testimonials from people who've had a positive experience is, is so critical, uh, I think, to uh, perpetuating it. Mm -hmm. AJ, would you like to go next? Um, great question from my coach that I love. Um, we, we have two, two avenues. We have every Wednesday we post on social media, Why Wednesday? So to our outward audience, we show them, hey, this is a story of a real life that's been impacted. But internally in the community, we have um, teachers, churches, barbershops, daycare workers, and the businesses within the community that are key stakeholders that we really, every month, I give them a $25 gift card to say, hey, when we have programs, someone from our team is gonna bring you flyers, pass these out. And so they put a stamp on it where, they, where the individual got the flyer from, so then we know, we keep track of that, we measure it, so that we know, hey, last month, man, you had 30 people, this month, let's get, the next month, let's get 50. And so we try to thank them with a $25 mm -hmm. gift card, so from the foundation standpoint, we have donors that really want to make sure people get uh, Reese, this is a plug, they're laughing at me. But that's where the organization say, hey, we believe in food, so we have key ambassadors that we incentivize mm -hmm. with a $25 gift card every month to help us spread the word. And what about yourself, Courtney? I mean, when someone has a good, you know, laundry session at your place, do they then invite the whole family? They all have laundry Sundays now? So, so we rent out the laundromat frequently and do free laundry days. And you come in, you get your laundry done. <laughs> it's like, where are you at again? <laughs> <laughs> and laundry, like, laundry is expensive. Our West Philly laundromat, a giant load of laundry, is eleven forty nine wow. for a load of laundry. So if you've not been to a laundromat recently, I think that's a good, good knowledge check there. Um, and some of this actually came for us of people started coming up to me and asking if they mm -hmm. could volunteer for us. And I didn't, one, I never thought about that, and two, I didn't think about the power of those interactions. And people just started saying, I'm here, I love what you guys are doing, how can I be helpful? Mm -hmm. So one, we open interviews up on our outreach team. We offered over 200 interviews, and you've got to get on the PA system yeah. and work the laundromat, or you have to get up and go do a survey. Mm -hmm. from someone in the community. Like, someone in the laundromat has to be willing to talk to you right. and, and do that survey and engage with you. So we, we're constantly asking the community, what do you want and what do you need? And I always explain, too, when someone says, why are you asking me these questions? I say, if you have a seven-year-old or if you're 70, they're very different things that mm -hmm. are appropriate mm -hmm. for you. And so all of these learnings of, one, asking the community, two, having the community raise their hand and say, how can I be a part of this? We're building something that we're calling the Fabric Fam, which is how do we leverage these ambassadors and these advocates for us to make sure that we are building with integrity of what our neighborhoods are asking for, but that we're getting the word out about what's possible. Um, and, and we've just found an incredible um, 
multiplier effect in, in doing that way. Oh, well, that's, that's fantastic. Um, Joseph, my question for you is, we were just talking about colorectal cancer and screenings for that. What are some other health services or preventative care that you teach barbers yeah. to talk to their clientele about? So this work in the barbershop actually started uh, around high blood pressure, where uh, in Dallas, Texas, we actually taught our barbers how to measure blood pressure and how to counsel their customers going to the doctor if their blood pressure was uh, high. And I love the uh, incentives that both uh, Courtney and AJ have uh, talked about because one of the incentives that we had for our customers was a free haircut if they participated in these uh, healthcare screenings. And we made sure to reimburse the free haircuts to the barbers so that they actually got a benefit as, as uh, well. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we have done this work not only around colorectal cancer and high blood pressure, but uh, we also uh, have started to focus on uh, diabetes as well with, uh, with uh, men getting, uh, getting their blood sugar checked and then being able to be uh, re re referred to healthcare if their blood sugar is, is high. So there, there, there really is sort of no end to the number of primary care sensitive conditions we can think about how we can address in the uh, barbershop. And uh, it doesn't just stop at, at uh, barbershops. Mm -hmm. uh, we have colleagues who do work in uh, beauty salons, um, and oh, so we also have uh, a, a program at our organization focused on breast cancer uh, mm. uh, outreach where we have reached over 20,000 uh, women around, uh, around breast health, uh, largely going to beauty salons, fitness classes. We have not gone to, to laundromats uh, or uh, grocery it. stores, but after talking to- Not yet, you, not <laughs> yet. <laughs> exactly. A AJ's always closing, so <laughs> I'm sure it'll work out. Uh, AJ anywhere. tried to get me to move to Tulsa yesterday. Yes. <laughs> uh, more, more questions, more questions. I see some, some, some amazing heads of hair here and some beautiful bald heads as well. I'm sure you all have some great questions here. I'll go to this gentleman in the cap. Oh. I don't think there's any question that you three are doing some amazing, amazing things. My question is, and speak briefly to it, how do you scale this up? How do you take mm. it to America? I mean, you're in Philly, you're in Tulsa. Who in the hell's in Tulsa? <laughs> Winners. <laughs> Winners, yes! <laughs> Got him. Yes. <laughs> we'll talk after. <laughs> but seriously, yes. how do you scale it up? AJ, you wanna start? I mean, there are food deserts across the nation. Yeah, uh, and thank you for that question. There's a quote that I love by, I can do things that you cannot, you can do things that I cannot, but together we can do great things. I think for Oasis, with the 53 million people that live in food deserts, almost 20% of the po U.S. population, the majority of those being black and brown communities, we can identify key stakeholders from the community and how can we identify businesses, universities, and or organizations that believe in healthcare, that believe in everyone having equity in fresh and health, healthy food? How can we duplicate the model? Because I, I couldn't have built a $6.5 million grocery store on my own. I didn't have that. But I had some amazing partners. Many of them are in this room today. And so that for-profit, non-profit, public-private partnership really is the key to do this on a scalable basis across the U.S. Mm -hmm. And you're going to be a part of that, too. <laughs> <laughs> Courtney? <laughs> yes, sir. So I'll, I'll tie this to the thing that I'm having nightmares about right now, mm. which is Medicaid redetermination. Um, up to 14, whoa, oh, is that? You're good. Me? Don't worry. You're good. It's, uh, the microphone is also having nightmares about Medicaid <laughs> redetermination. Um, up to 14 million Americans are at risk of losing Medicaid coverage. And so we've created this inadvertent second public health emergency within this first one. And that is, that is a massive terrifying problem. And, and everyone in this audience knows how scary that is to potentially be uninsured. So that is a massive problem for families. It is an existential business risk for payers. So when I think about what that looks like and how you scale. There are 30,000 laundromats across the US. They function as de facto community centers right now. One of my old students, every move her family made was based on the laundromat bulletin board. So they're already functioning that way. So if we make the investment in, in people, and listen, you wanna go to a laundromat when it's busy? Come when there's an Eagles game in West Philly on a Sunday afternoon, <laughs> there are 100 people in there. It's, it's crazy, so you have to make the investment in the time 
but it's also the technology. Mm -hmm. And so we're building the tech that's reflective of people, and, and that's not tech for tech's sake, but that allows us to scale across 30,000 laundromats mm -hmm. in rural or in urban and other places. Mm -hmm. But when I think about Medicaid redetermination and the $6,300 that is spent in, in Pennsylvania, and I think about one of our partners, UPMC, that has 700,000 Medicaid members, like that is real math with real ROI and that scales. Mm -hmm. And I think we have to be investing in models that scale like that because the problem is not unique to Tulsa or New York mm -hmm. or Philly. It is nationwide, but there is an incredible opportunity in solving those real problems for families that again are these massive problems mm -hmm. for the healthcare system. More questions, more questions. Anyone on this side of the room? This woman right here? Here it is. Oh, which one's the, oh, oh, there it is. <laughs> All right, ahead. hello, thank you guys so much. This is so um, invigorating. So I'm a psychologist and I'm frequently saying you can't mental health your way out of our mental health crisis. Mm. So why I'm here in this room is because I think the one thing you haven't talked about at all is mental health. Mm -hmm. So how are you guys thinking about that front line and those community and trusted adults and trusted peers and addressing mental health? Thank you. Thank you for that. Go right ahead, Joseph. Thank you so much for that question, and I do believe that uh, mental health is not talked about enough, particularly in communities of uh, color. Mm -hmm. um, I have uh, colleagues in New York City who are actually looking at this barbershop model as a way to address, uh, as a way to address uh, uh, mental health equity. Uh, and so um, one of my colleagues, uh, uh, Dr. Sidney Hankerson, uh, who is at uh, Mount Sinai, uh, he actually is looking at uh, teaching barbers uh, mental, health, mental health first aid. Um, mm. And uh, uh, in recognition that they often can serve that sort of uh, uh, frontline role. Um, and so it's something that we're absolutely thinking about and uh, that we definitely need, need to do more about. Thank you. Thank you for your question. More questions? This gentleman right here in the front row, and then I'll get to you. <laughs> Thank you, and uh, I think you all are doing incredible work. Uh, we're, I'm part of a family that has been in the barbering business uh, since the, the 60s, uh -huh. and we still have barber shops. And we're interested in what you're talking about. But normally, if you have a business or you want to get involved with a franchise, uh, there's some things that, that are already proven that should be in place in order for that franchise to be successful. Mm -hmm. So I'm believing that this can work. I just want to know, is there a way for us to get from you certain things that you know need to be in place. Uh, it doesn't have to be right now, but can we contact you? Can you make it possible for us to contact you so we can say, no, we need to have enough space for this to be there. These are the hours you gotta have somebody. This is how consistent it needs to be so that we can start to implement, the, implement this immediately. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yes. <laughs> Go right ahead. Yeah. Would, uh, would like so, so James, uh, we met earlier and, and thank you for your question, uh, and I'm so excited that, that, that your family still has uh, barbershops. I would love to uh, talk to you more about sort of, <laughs> but I would love to talk to you more about sort of, you know, what is uh, needed, but the fact, of, the, the, the fact of the matter is, just a, a willingness to do it is probably the uh, number one thing, but we can talk about what some of those operational things are. Uh, but, but I think the fact that there is a possibility of sort of franchising this, I think actually helps us move towards that uh, scalability uh, right. that the other gentleman was, was, was talking about. So uh, let, let's definitely connect. Great. Uh, right over here, my fresh and clean brother right there in the second row. Hey. Can we get him the mic? Hi, <laughs> <laughs> right, thank you so much. My name is Iwamag Valdu. I'm a medical student at Mayo Clinic and a health fellow. So it's just so amazing to hear about all these amazing initiatives. As a medical student, I've seen that there are times when it's been great to get people screened and do the poop test, but then now there's that next step, and they need to have uh, surgery to get that mm -hmm. taken care of. But then they're uninsured or they're underinsured. So how do you then help them bridge that roadblock and that next step so it's not just, hey, you might have colon cancer, but there's nothing we can do for you? Yeah. Great that, question. Great yes. question. Um, amazing question, and thank you for that. And unfortunately, uh, we, we see that often. Um, but uh, and. This really depends on, on, on where you live, but if I can just take New York City for uh, instance, when we identify uh, someone who has a uh, positive 
a, a positive screening test, uh, and it's clear that they need either further workup or, or they need, need uh, treatment, they can actually access uh, emergency uh, Medicaid to, to be able to uh, pay for it. That's not a great or long-term uh, solution, but as we think about um, scalability, uh, the, the sort of policy aspect of how do we uh, provide coverage so that people can actually get the treatment that they need once we actually do find something is something that we really need to continue to uh, work on. And having the partnership of payers and uh, policymakers is absolutely critical to the long-term uh, success of these kinds of models. This might be controversial, but I start with saying no. So if you're not going to do the linkages to care and if you're not gonna make sure people can be taken care of, we're not gonna work together. Mm -hmm. So there, there are lots of like researchers who are doing great work, but the last thing I need you telling one of the families that we've built trust with mm -hmm. is you've got this thing going on, good luck. Mm -hmm. And so we always make sure that we're working with partners and ask the question of what happens next? Mm -hmm. and, and what does that look like? And if, if it doesn't, I say, listen, I think you're doing great work, but like we're just not the right people to do it with. And so I think you have to start by, by being willing to have those hard mm -hmm. conversations and, and saying no and working and educating folks around, here's what this actually looks like and here's how we do this. And we also take it as a brand risk, right? In the same way that I tell my families, if I ever call you about your car rental, and or, sorry, your car warranty expiring, <laughs> I expect you to block Fabric's number and never talk right. to us again. <laughs> right. Like we, we have to build and protect that trust and when there have been situations where someone has had a bad experience, that is a brand and trust yeah. problem for mm -hmm. Fabric. And we have to own that and we have to do everything in our power to fix it. It doesn't matter, and someone told me one day, well, you guys didn't do anything wrong. Like this is, this is a system problem or this mm -hmm. is this person's problem or this part of the system failed that person. And I said, I don't care. Right. Like this is a problem that someone is, is dealing with and in this situation, it was someone who was at risk of losing his home because of a disputed bill. And so I don't really care at the end of the day whose problem it is. It is our responsibility to do our damnest to fix mm. it. And that, that is so important because the question of you know, what happens next and then navigating insurance and everything is, is so important. I mean, when I had my um, colonoscopy, um, even though I had been reporting on this and I knew that I wasn't supposed to be charged because of my family history, I still got a $2,000 bill in the mail and it took nine months of calling the health insurance companies and saying, hey, I know I'm not supposed to be charged for this um, to finally get it to disappear. And I can only imagine for the people who have to navigate that, who, who may not have the time to talk to the health insurance companies or may not have the, 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 the knowledge that you know, this screening in my case should have been covered uh, completely. So yeah, thank you, thank you so much for that, that question. And it's good to hear that you know, you're putting in place follow-ups to help people navigate their way after they yeah. use these services. Um, more questions right there. Great. Thank you. Hi, thanks so much. Um, my name is Brittany Rose. I'm a local elementary school teacher in the oh. Valley. Um, yeah, and so as someone, I'm, I'm, my question is kind of directed towards the barbershop model. Mm -hmm. um, as someone who's on the front lines, so to speak, who's asked to do a number of different professions within my one profession, mm -hmm. um, I'm curious what, um, if I'm curious about the barbers that are getting these additional trainings. Are they compensated for these additional trainings? Do they get a certificate saying, from the local university, you now have a certificate for administering such and such? Um, I am curious about those, those people and uh, if they get yeah, kind of points towards their education or incentive in their paycheck. Thank you. Terrific, terrific question and uh, yes to everything that that you said. In the programs that we've done, we've actually provided training uh, for our barbers, uh, you know, not just around measuring blood pressure, uh, but also on how to uh, re refer their customers if their blood pressure is high. Um, and when it comes to uh, colorectal cancer, we, uh, we don't just leave the barbers to their own uh, devices, we also make sure that they're supported with patient navigators who, who can actually navigate folks who are uh, discovered uh, to have a need for, for uh, uh, colon cancer screening. Um, to the question of uh, compensation, 
in our projects, absolutely. Uh, you know, um, we, uh, as I, uh, uh, as I've mentioned, we were sure to uh, to um, to offer the the customers free haircuts. But and and so, for instance, if a haircut is ten dollars, let's say, we would actually reimburse the barbers twenty dollars for that haircut, so that they can, so that they actually get something, uh, something, something from it. We did actually uh, make sure that they, once they completed their training, that they did in fact uh, receive, receive a uh, certificate from our uh, medical school, basically that they were certified blood pressure uh, uh, specialists. But certainly, as we think about scaling this, how we're going to compensate the interventionists is definitely part of the uh, calculus, and I really appreciate you uh, highlighting that. Great, thank you. More, more questions, yes, right here. Thank you. My name is Abby Ocampo Sapien, and I was a former community organizer. So this really just sparks a lot of interest in in me because I think organizing is the most pure form of creating change. So my question to you is: um, uh, Would you look at this as a two-gen approach, where you're maybe hiring the children or the grandchildren of these barbers, of the people who are at the laundromats and all of that? Would you ever consider that? So the um, economic well-being of the community mm. grows and mm -hmm. it, it becomes higher because I know some of our communities are working class and if we keep the money in there, you know, th they, they flourish. Oh, great. Courtney, would you like yeah. to take that question? Some of our best team members are laundromat users and there's a reason that they are our best people. Um, and they come from the community and there's that connection. We also hire organizers because they fundamentally understand that this is that work. Mm -hmm. And it's an extension of that. So at Fabric, we are a team of former teachers and social workers and mm -hmm. librarians. Um, and we, we take that trust importantly and we invest in the community in multiple ways and there are many more ways we should be doing better mm -hmm. as well. And AJ. Well, you got to meet my teammate Shada behind you, <laughs> who's also a, a passionate community organizer. Uh, but for us at Oasis, uh, we have community health workers, and we're, we just got a contract with our Tulsa Tech School. We will help our high school students that are employees get uh, certified so that way when they, by the time they graduate, they're coming out with a trade. And so we've won, won an award there so that way we can help train the, the two generation and my seven-year-old is a cashier every other Saturday. <laughs> <laughs> Keeping it in the community. <laughs> Keeping it in the community. <laughs> yes. Um, any other questions? Yes, right there. Uh, thank you for doing this work. Um, I've worked in home health care, but those are people who you really gain their trust, but they're people who are already in the insured system. Um, so there's so many people that get lost. <laughs> So thank you for doing this. But I'm curious, you said you did mammograms in the laundromat? Um, can you paint a picture of that? And was that for people, <laughs> was that for insured people, uninsured people? Uh, it's both. So we partnered with Jefferson Health, who had that commitment to making sure there was access to care regardless of ability to pay. Um, and they have a mobile mammography unit. And so they not only sent more med students than I could have ever ever used, um, but they also sent a mobile mammography unit. And there's a very different thing when, again, we know someone is a woman in that age group who has said, yes, I'm interested. I would like to do a mammogram. I never get around to it, or I've been meaning to do that. Um, there's a very different point of connection when you can do that, much less that woman can get free laundry on a Sunday and get one, two, three birds done with one stone. So we talk about it as trusted last mile engagement. And if we can do it for you know whatever you ordered online, mm -hmm. we can certainly do better in healthcare. Mm -hmm. We are nearly out of time, but this woman has had her hand up right <laughs> to the sky. I want to make sure we get to her, and then we'll f wrap up. Hello, Monica Van Busker. Courtney, I also stay up at night thinking about Medicaid redeterminations. Um, and I am sure someone in this audience is from CMS who has recently started granting out funds again to their navigators. So they should um, have you guys all come train their navigators on how to um, get engaged with grocery stores and laundromats and barbershops and help people get enrolled either in Medicaid or a qualified health plan and then navigate those benefits once they have them. Mm -hmm. However, we are, many of us healthcare leaders, 
um, hearing about this, thinking, oh, this is so great, community engagement. Where else should we be? If we mm. are issuers and providers, what is, what is your ask to us within the, the healthcare industry? Where else should we be? What else should we be doing? Can I start with AJ, if you want to take that? Every day we see about four to 600 customers that come through our doors every, every day, depending on the time of month. Where are their communities within your community? Schools, churches, synagogues, where there are uh, malls, mass amounts of people, I, I would say, try to go to those areas, develop key relationships, mm. and set up a booth and be consistent. In most underserved communities, a lot of people come in and poop and swoop. They think, hey, we've got the answer, rather than, hey, why don't you tell us what's best for the community? Engage the community. Mm -hmm. So your solution might not be the best that, that you think or your company might think, but you can co-collaborate with the community and the community organizer, shout out, <laughs> in order to create the best system that will actually positively impact that community. Great. And with that, we are out of time. Thank you all so much for coming to our panel. I hope. I hope we can keep this conversation going, this barber talk. Enjoy the rest of your time at Aspen. And if I could take um, a page out of AJ's book, put a quick plug. Um, at STAT, I host a podcast called Color Code on Health Equity. I would love it if you all gave it a listen. Awesome. Everyone, thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. <laughs>